بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم وأنا ما علينا يا عظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قول أما بعد All praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and peace be upon his beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I testify that there is no God except Allah Almighty and I testify that Muhammad is the prophet and the messenger of Allah My brothers and sisters in Islam it is once again a great honor and pleasure from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rahmah from Allah Almighty, that Allah from those many people and from the many of His creation accepted us to be here today. And wallahi, ikhwani, it's not the effort that you're putting to be part of this gathering, but it's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted you to put the effort. It's not you coming to the house of Allah, it's Allah accepting you to come to His house. It's not you being the guest of Allah, it's Allah accepting you to be his guest. So thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that and show the appreciation to Allah Almighty for that in return Allah Azza wa Jal will give you more in return. As you all are aware, we started with the biography of the beloved man and the most beloved man to Allah Azza wa Jal and to mankind. The biography of this great man Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sirat and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the aim of this biography, my brothers and sisters, is not just to entertain and delight our souls with the story of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, but for us to reflect, for us to reflect onto this great life of this great man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and try and get close to Allah azza wa jal by imitating the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Try and follow the path of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. As Allah Almighty, He says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Allah Almighty states in the Holy Quran in which He says, Say if you love Allah, Allah is saying, Say if you love Allah, then follow me. Referring to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Say if you love Allah, follow me as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah will love you in return. And not only that Allah will love you in return, but Allah will also forgive you sins. So love the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The love of Muhammad alayhi salatu wa sallam is the love of Allah. The love of Allah is the love of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And for us to love the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam more, we need to know more about him. So inshallah from this lesson, from this series of the biography of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, we ask Allah that... Not only that you know more about the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, but we ask Allah that inshallah you also love the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam even more. And last lesson we spoke about an introduction about the situation of the Arabian Peninsula before the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. And yet we have not began the biography of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam and yet today or tonight we will not even begin that but we'll still give you an overall picture how life was before the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, how the Arabian Peninsula was before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how the Arabs in which the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam was sent from, in which he was sent from, how their lifestyle was, and inshallah within few lessons we'll begin that story of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we said... That the Arabian Peninsula was more of an independent state in which Arabs were living, living more of a Bedouin life. And we mentioned the beginning of Mecca, how it started with Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam. And Ismail, as the scholars call him, Abu al-Arab, the father of the Arab. Keeping in mind, Ismail himself is not originally an Arab. But he was Arabized, as they say. He was Arabized in which he lived among the Arab from the tribe of Jurhum, who moved from Yemen living in Mecca. 
And then Ismail learned the Arabic language from them. He became so fluent in the Arabic language. And he mastered the Arabic language even better than the Arabs themselves. And Ismail alayhi salam, from being a prophet also to be a leader of the tribe, leader of his tribe or the leader of Mecca, and the people who were living in Mecca learned from Ismail, and Islam was established there in its natural form, in its original essence in Mecca. And we mentioned throughout the years, a tribe by the name of Khuza'a overthrew Jurhum, and uh, Khuza'a from them there was a man, Amr ibn Luhay, who was a leader so strong, so powerful, so respected that his word is not mentioned twice or his commands are not commanded twice. He was from the first people to bring the worship of idols in the Arabian Peninsula, and we mentioned that. So at that time, a few centuries before the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was sent, the Arab in Mecca from the religion of Ibrahim السلام, from the path of Ibrahim and Ismail and the religion of Islam into being pagans and into being idol worshippers. Now this is the situation and the situation just got worse until the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, came. Now around that, there's other situations. Around Mecca and around those areas there was other situations from those is in, it's important also for us to know how Judaism and Christianity entered the Arabian Peninsula in which we know Judaism and Christianity began and keeping in mind Judaism and Christianity Al Yahud Al Yahudiya and Nasraniya are not religions from the heavens as they say the only religion to Allah is Islam but from Musa alayhi salam as Bani Israel came after him, they distorted. They made many changes into the teachings of Musa and also from the teachings of Isa alayhi salam there was many changes. And um, the Arabian Peninsula as we mentioned was divided into different parts. And you had the Yemenis in the southeast and you had the Shamis in the northwest. And um, there was a leader in Yemen. There was a leader in Yemen by the name of Rabi'ah bin al-Nasr. Rabi'ah bin nasr he was a respected leader in Yemen. And the leaders in Yemen, they used to be named, their nickname was Tubba. Their nickname was Tubba. As they used to name the king of uh, Rome, they used to call him Qaisar. And they used to call the king of Persia, Kisra. And they, they call the king of Egypt, Muqawqas. And they call the king of Ethiopia, they call him a Najashi. They used to call the kings of Yemen Tubba. And the king back then, whose name is Rabi'a bin Nasr. Rabi'a bin Nasr was a very powerful king. One night, he saw an, uh, one night he saw a terrifying dream. Next morning, he gathered all the magicians and all the fortune tellers and the scholars around him, asking them for the interpretation of that dream. And he refused to mention... He refused to mention or speak out his dream before he took assurance from those who will tell them the dreams that they'll interpret the dreams. So it was hard. He'll bring the magician and the fortune teller and he'll say to him, if I tell you the dream, can you interpret that to me? So the magician or the fortune teller will say, I'm not sure unless you tell me. So Tubba or Rabi Abdul Nasr refused to mention that until he had two fortune tellers and there are two fortune tellers who guaranteed him they will interpret that dream. So he got each fortune teller from those two, he got them on an isolated or an isolation, speaking his dreams to them, or speaking his dreams to, the, uh, to one of them, and then he spoke to the other one in isolation so he could see if there's matching. When he spoke about his dream, both of them responded back to him saying, there'll be black people, and one said from the Sudanese, the black people all, and the other one said from Ethiopia, there will be black people who will come and conquer Yemen and take over, take over Yemen and throw you out of your kingdom. When he heard the first one speaking out like that, then he sat down on the, with the other one in isolation and spoke the same. Rabi'a, Tubba, he realized that them two had agreed on the interpretation of the dream. So he got more scared and he got more terrified. So he realized 
that the interpretation of that dream coming from two different sources is going to be true. So what did he do? He sent his family out of Yemen to Najiran. Najiran is one of the northwest suburbs or northwest states in the Arabian Peninsula linked to Sham. Sham at that time, which Bilad Sham at that time, Syria, it's what we know as Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Palestine, was under was under the colonies of uh, under the uh, was colonized or was under the Roman Empire, and uh, the Roman Empire, uh, the Roman Empire or the Roman Emperor back then, he a letter was sent from Rabi'a to him asking him to protect his family. So he sent him to Najiran. Then the family of Rabi'a bin Nasr settled in Najiran and moved away from Yemen. And then Rabi'a ibn Nasr himself moved away from Yemen into Najiran living with his own family. And there, the family of Rabi'a ibn Nasr grew up. Rabi'a passed away and then he had children. And then his children wanted to go back to Yemen. One of the children of Rabi'a ibn Nasr by name of Tubban As'ad ibn Rabi'a, he became the leader of his tribe. And he wanted to go back to Yemen. On the way, he went past Yathrib. Yathrib back then is the name of Medina. Before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated to Medina, the name of the city was called Yathrib or Taiba. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated to it, they called it Medina, the city of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tubban bin As'ad, uh, Tubban As'ad, the son of Rabi'a, he had a son who had sent him to Medina. Or sent him to Yathrib. Over there, his son was killed. So Tubban As'ad, the son of Rabi'a, wanted to retaliate for the death of his son. So he came with an army to Yathrib. And during the day, Tubban As'ad will fight against the people of Medina or the people of Yathrib. And at night, the people of Yathrib will send good hospitality to Tubban. So Tubban bin As'ad is fighting the people of Yathrib. During the day, they fight him. The people of Yathrib fight him. During the night, they were generous to him to send him food, send him hospitality. So Tubban was amazed from such generosity. And this was the quality of the people of Medina. And subhanAllah, you'll find that till these days, till this day, that the people of Medina have good generosity, good hospitality in them. And even when you go to Hajj, you'll find big difference between the people of Mecca and people of Medina. Not degrading the people of Mecca. Maybe they have different qualities than the people of Medina. But the people of Medina always had the quality and had the attribute of being generous. So Tubban bin Asad will fight the people of Yathrib during the day and at night the people of Yathrib will send him ikram, will send him food, will send him hospitality, will send him gifts. So Tubban was amazed. Tubban was amazed. And he said, amazing to such an enemy. Fight you during the day and generous to you at night. Where usually an enemy is just waiting for the moment to destroy you. Whether destroy you by a weapon or destroy you by hunger or starvation. But the people of Yathrib will fight to ban As'ad during the day. And will be generous to him. Send him the hospitality and food and water and drinks and presents at night. While to ban As'ad bin Rabi'a was fighting against the people of Yathrib. Yathrib was surrounded with some of the tribes of the Jews. There was Bani Quraida, Bani Nadir, Bani Qaynuqa. Two scholars from Bani Quraida, who are scholars from the Jews, came to Tubban. When Tubban was fighting against the people of Yathrib. And they came to Tubban to give him an advice. They told him, look, this place is a protected place. It's going to be the settlement of a prophet that's coming very soon. And I do not advise you to fight against the people of the city or else Allah will send his wrath upon you. I advise you to go back to Yemen. And he listened and he kept on listening from those two scholars from the Jews. And he liked their teachings. And day by day, them preaching to Tuban, Tuban accepted the religion of Judaism. And this was the beginning how the religion of Judaism started to begin and start in the Arabian Peninsula. And to ban like those two scholars from the Jews, that he made them he, one of his main men. He made them one of his main consultants. 
And he took them from Yathrib and they start to travel with him. He left Medina and he took the advice of those two scholars from the Jews. And he realized that these two scholars are very firm on what they say. And he became a Jew himself and he followed their religion. And they became his advisors. And they advised him to leave Yathrib to go back to Yemen. So he left Yathrib. On the way traveling to Yemen, Mecca comes in between. So Mecca is in between Medina, Yathrib and Yemen. On the way traveling to Yemen, he met two Arabs from the tribe of Hudayn. Those two Arabs wanted to plot against Tubban. And they wanted also to plot against Quraysh. And they had a bigger problem with Quraysh than what they had with Tubban. And they saw Tubban with a big army traveling past Mecca. So they wanted to take advantage of that to turn Tubban against Quraysh. For Tubban to demolish Quraysh and then they themselves will be free from the harm of Quraysh. So they came to Tubban and they told him, look, if you really want wealth, you want jewelry, you want gold, you want silver, there's a house by the name of Kaaba. Under that house, it's full of jewelry, full of gold, full of silver. And the people of Quraysh are so selfish, they would not let anyone go near it. So if you really want to become rich, go to that house, demolish it, and take its silver, and take its gold and jewelry, and then you will earn a great kingdom and, and, and you'll have a, a great treasure. Deceiving him. And of course, if Quraysh loses the Kaaba, then Quraysh has no longer respect among the Arab because they were respected because of the Kaaba. So Tubban got deceived. And what Tubban did, he went towards Mecca to demolish the Kaaba and to take out the jewelry and take it for himself. Who heard of his attempt? Those two scholars from the Jews. When they heard Tubban is attempting to go and demolish the Kaaba and take out the jewelry and Vanished the Kaaba, they came to him and said, If you want to destroy yourself, you will go and destroy the Kaaba. By Allah, no one had ever came near that house, and Allah Azza did not destroy him. This house is the only house of Allah, and it's the house, it's the only house of Allah, and anyone that attempted suit, anyone that intended suit, which means anyone that intended, had intention of harm, or bringing harm to this house, Allah Azza brought the harm back to them. So he said, what do I do? They told him, these people, the tribe from Hudayn, these two men from the tribe of Hudayn are trying to deceive you and play a game on you. So what he did in return, he grabbed them and he killed them. He slaughtered them. And, he, and those two scholars from the Jews told him, go back, go to Mecca and do what the rest of the pilgrims do. You go, you, prefer, you do circulation, tawaf around the Kaaba and you slaughter for the sake of Allah and you feed the poor and you do the rest of the people what the rest of the people do so he went and he wanted done tawaf and he slaughtered and he started to give out a lot of generosity giving the food and the water and the drinks to many of the pilgrims who came and one night he was asleep he was there for a few days and one of the days when he was asleep he saw himself covering the Kaaba where the Kaaba was never been covered before then it was just left on its natural state so he woke up the next morning and he covered the Kaaba with the best of materials. The, th the next night he saw himself again covering the Kaaba with a better material. Say so the next day he ordered to cover the Kaaba with a better material. And then the third day, the third night he saw himself covering the Kaaba with better material than the previous two materials. So the third day he woke up and he ordered his soldiers to cover the Kaaba and himself is to cover it with better materials. And that's when it became the Sunnah of covering the Kaaba. And he stayed that sunnah covering the Kaaba with three materials over each other until the time of Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa as some of the historians say, in which it stopped from three materials to one material. And then they continued that till this day, that we're all aware that the Kaaba is covered. Before Tubban As'ad, it was never covered. Until he saw that three dreams... Three nights, three dreams, covering the Kaaba with better material each night. So he started to cover them with three materials. And that stayed a sunnah, stayed a path, a way that people kept on doing after Tubban Asad until the time of Abdul Muttalib in which became one, uh, one cloth covering the Kaaba. And then Tubban Asad went back to Yemen. And... Tubban is the king of Yemen. He took over the kingdom of Yemen and they were named to be Tubba. The names of the kings of Yemen, they were named as to be Tubba. 
When Tuban Asad arrived to Yemen, the people of Yemen refused entry for Tuban, saying that you've changed your religion. And they used to worship idols and fire. So Tuban Asad. Tuban Asad was refused entry by the tribe of Himyar was the main tribe in Yemen. They refused them entry saying that you changed your religion so that you've got no space or you've got no place within us. So Tuban Asad said, by Allah, my religion and the religion of those two scholars is the true religion. And what they used to have in Yemen back then, if there was a dispute over religious matters, they used to get to this fire that was locked up. That fire that was locked in a house. And when there's a dispute over any religious matter, they'll open the doors of that fire. And wherever the fire comes to, that fire will come and destroy one of the parties. That means the, one, the party that's been destroyed by the, by the fire is the wrongdoing party. And the one that stays alive is the right party. So this is one of the things they used to believe in. If two people are in dispute or two parties are in dispute, they'll open the fire. And whoever the fire attacks means that we're the wrong ones. So they said, let us go and make the, go to the, take the judgment of the fire. And the, I mean, this is how low their mentality was, just small-minded. So they went to the fire, the tribe of Himyar, and those two scholars from the Jews. And when they opened the fire, the fire came and attacked, came to attack the scholars from the Jews. So they started, the two scholars from the Jews. So they moved away. So the people of Yemen told them, don't move and have patience. So they stood there, having patience over the heat of the fire until the fire swifted away towards the people of Himyar and burned them. So when the people of Yemen saw that, they took that as a sign of truth that the religion of those two scholars from the Jews is the right religion and the religion that we're on is the wrong religion. So the people of Yemen turned to Judaism. And that's how the religion of Judaism began in Yemen. That's how the religion of Judaism began in Yemen. Until Tuban, Tuban As'ad passed away, his brother, uh, his son, his son, his name Hassan bin Tuban, became the next king of Yemen. Hassan was strong and powerful, but he, he deceived himself and he was so eager to take over the Arabian Peninsula. So he forced his army to fight everyone in front of him and to take over the Arabian Peninsula. And many of the generals in his army refused to obey him. And they found Hassan is too eager, too selfish that he wants to take over the whole world and make them suffer in the battlefield. So what did they do? They deceived Hassan's brother, his name is Amr. And Hassan, the king at that time, Hassan bin, uh, bin Tuban, he was, so, he was so picky and sus over anyone that will come into his room. He will refuse anyone to come and sit down with him, only specific people. One of them is his own brother. So the generals in his army spoke to his brother Amr. And they knew the only one that could take them out of this torture of them fighting and fighting against everyone is, their, is his brother Amr. So they came and gathered around Amr and they told Amr, the brother of Hassan, which are both the children of Tuban Asad, they told Amr, your brother is torturing us. And you are the best king to be the leader and the king and to lead the people of Yemen. And we stand by you if you get rid of your brother. And they kept on deceiving his brother, deceiving his brother. All the generals agreed except one general by the name of Dhuri'ain. He refused. And then when Amr agreed with the rest of the generals, Dhuri'ain, he wrote a poem expressing his refusal and disapproval of what he's going to do. And he put it in a letter and he gave it to Amr and he said, keep that with you. I'll tell you to open it one day. He was smart. So what happened? Amr walked into his brother's tent, Hassan, and he took out a knife and he killed him. Now the leadership of Yemen and the generals, as they promised, they gathered around Amr and stood by Amr. And what was the return that Amr was supposed to give back to the generals is to stop the wars and go back to Yemen. Because the generals went against Hassan, his brother, because Hassan is taking them into wars and killing their own children and families. And they don't want that. They want to stay in Yemen. They're happy there. And there's no need to be too selfish to take over the whole world. So they, they agreed that Hassan will be killed by Amr. In return, the Amr takes him back to Yemen and no more wars. And Am Amr did so. So Amr went back with his army, the Yemeni army, went back to Yemen. But Amr, when he became the king and went back to Yemen, 
He can't sleep anymore. He's been so depressed and stressed. He can't sleep anymore, always been stressed, always been depressed over the killing of his own brother. He killed his own brother. So he, he would not sleep the night and stress during the day and being so depressed. So he gathered the fortune tellers and the doctors and the advisors around him. And he said, I can't sleep the night. I'm depressed during the day. My, my, my mind is going to bust. What do I do? So they told him no one had ever killed his brother and did not go through what you went through. Because your own actions, killing your own brother, that's why you're going through this. So he said, what do I do? So they told him, his advisor said, you have to kill the generals who encourage you to kill your brother. So he brought all the generals and he started to kill each one of them who encouraged him to kill his own brother. And then when he came to kill Zura'ain, he told them, hold on a sec. Remember the letter I gave you? Can you please bring it out now? So he brought the letter out and he had two poems expressing his disapproval and not agreeing with him over the killing of his brother. He said, remember? And I told you, I was against you killing your own brother. So you've got no rights to kill me. So Amr let him go. Amr, Ben Tuban, let him go. And because of that depression that he was going through, he passed away. He died from sadness and depression. Killing your own brother is not an easy thing. Why ever been deceived by the generals? And then, after Amr ben Tuban, when Amr passed away, a, tr a, a man by Lukhayni'a Dhu Shanatir, he was from the tribe of Himyar, he was more of a gangster at that time, very evil. And he was one of those who was committing homosexualities. And he had a big gang around him. And because of the division within the family of Tuban Asad, after the action of his own children, one of them killing their own brother, the family of Tuban was divided. So Lakhni'a, Dhu Shanatir, took advantage of this, him and his gang, so they overthrew the family of Tuban Asad from the kingdom, from the throne, and they took over Yemen. And the Dhu Shanatr spread corruption in Yemen. And people were just sick of the corruption and the actions of Dhu Shanatr until they went to one of the brothers, one of the brothers of Amr, which another son of Taban bin Asad, his name Dhu Nawaz. And Dhu Nawaz is a very important figure in history in which begins a door into the biography of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Dhu Nawas, at the, time of his, at the time of the death of his brother Hassan and the death of his brother Amr, he was young. And then Dhu Shanatr took over. Dhu Nawas grew up and he became strong and wise young men. When Dhu Shanatr was spreading corruption in Yemen, the people of Yemen got sick of Dhu Shanatr, so they said the only one that could save you from the corruption of Dhu Shanatr is Dhu Nawas, who is from the descendants of those who have been in kingdom for many years. So they went to Dhu Nawaz after he was a brave young man, wise enough to take responsibility. Dhu Nawaz plotted to gang kill Dhu Shanatr, so he went into the palace where Dhu Shanatr was sitting. He had, he had a knife hidden in his shoe. He took it out, he killed him, slaughtered his head, he took it off, and people were so happy to see that Dhu Shanatr is out of the kingdom. Dhu Nawaz ran away. He fled thinking that everyone's going to turn against him. But on the contrary, even the army of Dhu Shanatr stood by Dhu Nawaz and they said, you are the only one that can bring justice back to Yemen. So Dhu Nawaz now again, the children of Tuban bin Asad are again the kings of Yemen. Now Dhu Nawaz, as we mentioned, Dhu Nawaz was a Jew on the same religion as his father and his brothers. In Najiran was more a Christian dominated area. How Christianity came to Najiran? It came through one of the followers of Isa alayhi salam. Of course, not direct followers, but from the followers of the, uh, of the path of Isa alayhi salam. His name is Fimion. Fimion was a slave Christian who was working for his master. His master is from Najiran. The people of Najiran used to worship a palm tree. They had a palm tree. They used to worship this palm tree. 
They, when they need something, they go to the palm tree. When they're in need of something, they ask the palm tree. When they want water, they go to the palm tree. When they need kids, they go to the palm tree. And then when the palm tree gives fruits, they eat from the palm tree. I don't know how that makes sense. <laughs> the people of Najiran, Najiran, as we mentioned, the people of Najiran used to worship a palm tree. Until this slave, Christian slave, by the name of Femion, came among them and he was... Uh, the, the, master, the master of Fumyon was from the people of Najiran. Fumyon, they say he was a righteous man and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appeared many miracles on his hands. And his master was amazed from the character of Fumyon. And one night when Fumyon was used to pray and wake up the nights and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah azza wa used to appear light out of him. Obviously he was following the right path. And one day the master of Femion came and into the room of Femion and he saw Femion praying and you know, uttering with words he's never heard before and he saw an amazing light. So he approached him and he said, what's this religion that you have? So Femion preached to his master and his master said, but the people of Najiran will refuse your worship and refuse your ideology if they're not of it because we worship this tree of ours. So Femion said, how about if I tell you that my Lord will destroy your Lord? He said, if that's the case, then get your Lord to destroy our Lord so we could know that your Lord is the powerful Lord and we follow him. So what Fimion asked, he asked for the people of Najran to be gathered around that tree they used to worship. And Fimion asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send a thunder to destroy that tree. And while Fimion is praying to Allah azza wa jal, asking him for that, a thunder came from the heavens. A great lightning, lightning came from the heavens with a thunder that destroyed and burned that tree. When the people of Najiran saw that, they were amazed. So they realized that the worship of Naj uh, Fimion is the right worship. So the people of Najiran turned to the religion of Isa alayhi salam. And obviously distortions start to take place. From Najiran, some members of Najiran migrated from Najiran, which is in the northwest, down to Yemen. And from those members, among them they used to be from the scholars of the religion of Isa alayhi salam. At that time, it was the time of Dhunawa. So now, that's how Christianity now started to enter Yemen. At that time, it was Dhunawa who was the leader and the king of Yemen. Dhunawa used to rely, and that was one of the customs of the Jews. Until this day, they depend a lot on fortune tellers and magicians. Magic is one important aspect in their life. And Dhunawa, as a Jew, used to depend a lot on magicians. And one of his main magicians... One of the main magicians of Dhunawas was getting so old that Dhunawas was afraid that once this magician dies, he's going to carry the knowledge of magic. So the magician himself requested from Dhunawas to get a young, brave, mature child, uh, kid to get him to learn the magic from him. So Dhunawas chose from his town a young, wise, open, very open child to learn the magic from that magician. As I mentioned, some of the members of Najiran and some of the scholars of the deen of Isa alayhi salam migrated to Yemen. Now this is a story that's been narrated in the Sahih and it's been narrated by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Where Dhunawas chose a young child, a young kid, to start learning the magic from that magician. Now that kid... On the way to the magician from his house, he started to go past a tent in which he hears strange uttering. So he started to look through that tent and he started to see people uttering. He started to see a worshipper, a man who's uttering and performing such worships that he's never, such worshiping that he's never seen before. Day by day, going from his house to the magician, he started to go past that man in that tent. That man used to be from the scholars of the religion of Isa alayhi salam, from the Christians. Or, as I mentioned, Christianity, and it maybe it was distorted at that time, and that's why they were called Christians. If they were following the pure religion of Isa, it's Islam. But it was distorted at that time, it was changed, and uh, Allah alam how far it was changed, and that's why this child... Going from his house to the magician, he started to go past that scholar, the Arahib. And then the kid started to learn from the Arahib. 
And he started to become more interested in the teachings of that scholar than the teachings of that magician. But every day he goes past the, past the place of that scholar, he started to become late to go to the magician. So the magician started to ask him, why are you late? And then when he goes back home, late to his parents, his parents will ask him, why are you late? So he complained to the scholar. And the scholar told him, when you go to the magician and he tells you why you're late, tell him my parents delayed me. And when you go to your parents and they ask you why you were late, tell him the magician delayed me. But don't mention my name. And then that kid became a follower of that scholar. And when he became a follower of that scholar, that scholar told him, you following me, you are opening yourself to great torture. You are opening yourself to a great hardship. And if one day you get captured, don't you ever mention me. And day by day, that kid will go from his house, from his home, go past the rahib, the scholar, learn from him, then go to the magician just to show his presence there, and then go to his parents. Until, until the news start to come out. And that kid, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him wisdom and gave him knowledge. And that kid start to cure people. People will become ill to him. People are ill, they'll come to him. He cured them by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the news came to Dhunawas. And there's a narration also mentions that Dhunawas had one of his advisors were blind, was blind. And he went to that kid and that kid, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him cure that blind man and made him sight again through or on his hands. So Dhunawas saw his blind minister one day or advisor and he told him, how did you get your sight back? He said, through that kid. So Dhunawas knew that it's that child that he, or that kid that he's assigned to learn from the magician. So what came to his mind that this kid became so good in the magic? So he brought that child, or that kid, and he told him, you became so good in magic, better than your own master, the magician. So that kid spoke and said, no, that's not magic. And then he said, that's what? He said, that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, what Allah? What religion? And then he started to tell him about the new faith that Dhunawas never knew of. So Dhunawas became so angry because he is a Jew and he's enforcing Judaism over people. For this man to come with a new religion referring to Isa, he's not going to accept something like that. And then he asked him, where did you learn this religion from? He refused to speak out and continued to enforce on him. Who did you learn this religion from? He refused to speak out. So he sent his soldiers out to look for anyone who has a different way of worship until they captured that scholar that this kid learned from. And he brought that scholar and he killed him. And then he forced that kid to leave the religion of Isa and follow Judaism. And that kid refused. So he ordered his soldiers to take him and to get rid of him by drowning him in the middle of the sea. A group of soldiers went on a boat, going in the middle of the sea of the ocean, this kid asked Allah to protect him. Everyone drowned and he came back safely. And he walked again to Dhunawas. Dhunawas was amazed. I'll send, my soldier, I'll send my soldiers to destroy you. They get destroyed, he come back. So he sent his soldiers again to throw him over a peak of a mountain. This kid is walking with a group of soldiers. He will ask Allah to protect him. The mountain will shake. The soldiers will fall down, destroyed, and he'll come back alive to Dhunawas. Then I was amazed. What's happening? There's something, uh, there's something unusual here. Something amazing. I send my soldiers to destroy you and you come back alive and they come back dead. So the kid spoke out and he said, the only way you could kill me is you have to listen to what I tell you. What is it? He said, you gather the people of Yemen and you put me and you tie me, around the, uh, you tie me on a tree and you get one of you good spear of arrow throwers to throw an arrow but before he throws it to say out loud in the name of the Lord of uh, in the name of the Lord of this young man in the name of the Lord of this young man so he said you get me you tie me on a tree you get one of your professional arrow throwers and then you gather the whole city to see that and then that's when you get rid of me so Dhu Nawaz took that and he gathered the people of Yemen he tied them on a tree he got one of his professional arrow throwers and then he spoke saying in the name of the Lord of this young man and he threw the arrow and he killed the young man when people saw that they realized the Lord of the young man is the true Lord 
20,000 of them followed that young man. And little that Dunawas knew, he's not getting rid of one, he's getting rid of one, but bringing 20,000 of them. 20,000 of them embraced the religion of Isa alayhi salam. Now Dunawas, this became a disaster on him. So he started to torture those 20,000 of them. Either but come back to Judaism or get killed. And then he started to dig up the ditch. And this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, قُتِلَ أَصْحَابُ الْأُخْدُودِ Allah Azza wa says, destroyed were the owners of the ditch, of the fuel-fed fire. So he started to dig up ditches, filled up with fire, and he started to cast each one of them, he embraced the religion of that child or kid, and throw them in that ditch. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he says, one of the females, one of the women, who had a baby child, a baby, ba a baby child being carried by her, she was thrown in, in the ditch of fire and then the child spoke and he said, Oh mother, don't be afraid, you will be in the paradise. And then she was casted in the fire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions that in the Quran, وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الْبُرُوجِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْمَوْعُودِ وَشَاهِدٍ وَمَشْهُودٍ قُتِلَ أَصْحَابُ الْأُخْدُودِ أَصْحَابُ الْأُخْدُودِ referring to the people of the ditch. النَّارِ ذَاتِ الْوَقُودِ A fire filled, a fuel of fire. Idhum alayha qu'uda watching the Dunawas and his army and his soldiers just watching them being burnt and tortured in the fire. Wahum ala ma yafaluna bil mu'minina shuhud. They are witnessing everything that's happening to them. Wama ma naqamu minhum illa yu'minu billahi al aziz al hamid. Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying the only thing they had against them to torture them is because they believed in Allah Azza wa Jalla. The only thing they had against them is because they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the incident in the Quran Kareem. So Dhunawas, Dhunawas was a Jew. When that child was killed and the people of Yemen embraced the religion of that child, he tortured them, 20,000 of them. And he dug up ditches full of fire and he threw them in that fire, burning them. Only one man, one man by Dhu Laban, one man, by the name of Dhu Thalaban or Daus Dhu Thalaban, fled from that torture. He went all the way to Rome, all the way to the Roman Emperor, complaining to him about what Dhu Nawaz did. Why the Roman Emperor? Because the Roman Emperor was a Christian himself. So Daus Dhu Thalaban, he ran all the way, he fled, and the army of Dhu Nawaz tried to track him and they couldn't. So he sent he sent an Aduna was sent an army that tried to track him. They couldn't capture him. And he fled all the way to the Roman Emperor, pleading for his help. So what the Roman Emperor said to him? He said, the Roman Emperor got enthusiastic about it. He's killing these people because they followed our religion. Then we'll show him what we'll do. So what did the, the Roman Emperor do? He had the Ethiopia under him. And there was the Najashi, the king of Ethiopia. And there were also Christians. So the Roman Emperor gave those Dhu Thalaban a letter to go to the Najashi, asking the Najashi to go and retaliate for those Christians that were killed. So those Dhu Thalaban went with a letter from the Roman Emperor to a Najashi, the Ethiopian king. And then the Ethiopian king sent an army of 70,000 Ethiopians traveling through, uh, on the sea or through the sea to Yemen with the leadership of Ariyat. So he sent 70,000 Ethiopian soldiers. And this is, this is where the interpretation of those two scholars that told Rabbi Abdul Nasr, the first man we spoke about, about the, uh, about the black people or the Sudanese or the Ethiopians coming to overtake your land became true. So, and Najashi, the, uh, the, 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 the Ethiopian king, he sent Ariyat, who is the general of the army of 70,000 Ethiopian soldiers to Yemen. And they went and fought against Dhu Nawaz and his army. And Ariyat and his army, 70,000 of them, destroyed the army of Dhu Nawaz. And Dhu Nawaz fled. And he refused to be captured by the Ethiopians or to be killed by the Ethiopians. He kept on fleeing until he went to the sea and he kept on going in the sea until he committed suicide or he drowned in the sea. He refused 
the hands of the Ethiopians to lay on him or to be captured by them. Now Yemen is going through a new phase. It's going through the phase of the Ethiopians. And now the Ethiopians with the leadership of Ariat took over Yemen. And Ariat was an Ethiopian, a general from the army of the Ethiopian king. And Ariat was so tough and rough that the Ethiopians and his soldiers and the general started to complain of his roughness and hardships. And, 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 and it being hard. So one of the generals of Ariat, his name is Abraha. One of the generals of Abi Ariat, his name is Abraha. He turned against Ariat. And the army of the Ethiopian army was split to two. One with Ariat, one with Abraha. And Ariat is the original or the essential general who's been sent and assigned by the Ethiopian king. Now, in, Ethiopia, in, in Yemen, the Ethiopian army were, or the Ariat was too tough on the soldiers and the generals, so they split. One group was with Abraha, another group with Ariat. And then the two groups came face to face. Before the two groups fighting one another, Abraha sent a letter to Ariat, saying to him, instead of getting the Ethiopians fighting one another, the issue is between me and you. Let us come out and fight one another. And whoever wins, the Ethiopian army will unite under him. So Abraha came out, fighting Ariat, and then Abraha killed Ariat. Before Abraha, before Abraha killed Ariat, Ariat had an, a spear. He came to attack Abraha, keeping in mind Abraha was much shorter than Ariat, and Ariat was much bigger than Abraha. And when Ariat came to attack Abraha, Abraha moved his head where the, uh, where the spear clipped an edge of his nose. And that's why he was named Abraha al Ashram. Ashram means cut. So he was cut from his nose. And then Abraha jumped on Ariat, deceiving Ariat because he had one soldier behind Abraha hiding to fight with him. So that soldier jumped on Ariat and Abraha killed Ariat. So then the Ethiopian army was united under Abraha. Who heard of that? The Ethiopian king. When the Ethiopian king heard that Abraha overthrew his own general, the Ethiopian king so, got so angry and Najashi got so angry and he made an oath that he's going to walk all the way to Yemen, cut, cut the hair of Abraha and step on it on the lands of Yemen. So Abraha was in a difficult situation. He can't face the Najashi. The Najashi is too big and too powerful for Abraha to face him. So what did Abraha do? He shaved his hair and he got a bag of the sand of Yemen and he sent a messenger to the Najashi, to the king of Ethiopia, saying very diplomatic and nice words that I am with you and I stand by you and you are my master and always be a master. You always be my master. I was a slave of yours and Ariat was a slave of yours and I'll continue to be a slave of yours. And I've heard of the oath that you did. For that I got you my hair and he is some of the dust from the land of Yemen. Put my hair at the top of that dust and step on it. Isn't that what you promised? So when the Najashi saw that and he saw the loyalty of Abraha towards him, he became happy and he sent him a messenger saying, then I'll endorse you to be the leader and the general of Yemen. Stay there and take care of Yemen. Abraha in return, he wanted to, he's still afraid that the Najash is angry from him. So what did he do? And this is where the story of Ashab al-Fil begins. Abraha, he built a church, a place of worship. He said, I'm going to build a church, a place of worship that's never ever been built in the Arabian Peninsula as a respect to the Najashi. So he could get the endorsement of the Najashi and take that doubt out of the Najashi's mind. Because any time the Najashi could take him out, suspend him, or get rid of him, or kill him. So he wanted to pay back the Najashi, the Ethiopian king, by building a massive church by the name of Qulais. And not only built it, but he said, I'm not only going to build it for the Najashi, but I'm going to turn the Arabs away from the Kaaba to come to this Qulais. And this is where the story of Ashab al-Fil begins for insha'Allah to continue with that next week. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka ba ashab al-fil 
ألم يجعل كيدهم في تضليل وأرسل عليهم طيرا أبابيل ترميهم بحجارة من سجيل فجعلهم كعصف مأكول and this is where the door or the gates that will get us into the birth of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and uh, we'll see inshallah next week to listen to or download more Islamic lectures please visit www.islamicmedia.com.au